Welcome to Fruit and Christian Fellowship. We got Pastor Jared, Deacon Chris on stage. And uh, we're going to be talking about um, how Jesus made us fishers of men. Uh, good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us online. High five. Holy high fives. Good morning. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning. Gatti. Abene. Awesome. So yeah, Sunday message, Jesus will make us fishers of men. We're going to be looking at four places in the Bible, Matthew 4, 19, Mark 16, 15, and a couple verses after that as well, I think 18 or 19, Luke 8, 4 through 15, the parable of the sower, and then 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and a few verses after that where he talks about God providing good seed to the sower. So uh, before we start, uh, Chris, you want to open us in prayer? Yeah, let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, I'd like to thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. Thank you for everyone that is joining us online, Lord, and everyone that is here this morning, and anyone that's on their way, Lord, bless their trip. And Lord, to speak to uh, the viewers and help us and give us the words, Lord, to say this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. So uh, the next slide we're going to show uh, is the gospel tent. So the Northern Fair Shiprock uh, was just a couple weeks ago. And I thought as a church, we can kind of debrief, talk about our attempt to go fishing. Uh, so, Jared, you want to talk a little bit about that, the Navajo Fair and some of the partners that we have there on the screen? Yeah, we were down at the Shiprock Fair, the Northern Navajo Nation Fair. And we were right, if you know Shiprock, right, we're right over the bridge, right at the main intersection, and, uh, and we, we're set up there. So anybody coming from Arizona, from the south, anybody coming from the north, they had to pass our tent there. So Chuck had this wild idea, you know, it's, it was probably, what, two weeks before? Maybe God put it on your heart. It wasn't very long, right? And, and, and pieces just started falling together. And, uh, and from that, uh, because of uh, the, the connection that the church has, that, that Chuck has, and has created this, this network of the, of the uh, Navajo Nation outreach, uh, we partnered with, I can't see, so uh, uh, Navajo Nation um, outreach, so that, that's uh, Chuck's outreach and all out that, we, that uh, he started, and he's been trying to bring all the pastors together, you know, our church, Fruitland Christian Fellowship. I can't read any of those. Hear the Cry, that's Derek's ministry. Yeah. And then TCT, Total Christian Television. And then Bibles uh, for the World. And then you could give the, yeah. tell the rest there. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, yeah, and Punch, uh, who owns uh, Buck's Tire and Towing, right there at the intersection, that junction, the two, it's like a T. Um, that's where the judges' stands were, right in front of us. And we had a 30 by 40 tent. Total Christian Television sent us 62 boxes of books. We're going to talk about that when it comes to seed for the sower. And um, uh, Al and Afayet Ministries came about five hours away. Their families are singing yeah. music, yeah. music ministry. They came for Saturday. We tried to park with So Worship and, and Julie and Pastor Ray and Pastor Derek. And um, yeah, so that was kind of cool that we had some partnerships there. But um, at the end of the day, uh, we're doing what, uh, well, first of all, at the beginning of the ministry, we're going to talk about these verses, maybe spend two minutes each. And then at the end of the service, we're going to ask you guys to come up and share maybe your experience at the Shiprock Fair, a little bit on the mic over there. So at the beginning of the ministry, he's calling his disciples, and uh, in Matthew 4, 19, he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So that's while they're real fishers, fisher men, catching real fish with nets. And uh, I would just say I heard a devotion once that when I think about going fishing, especially in Florida, I think about using my pole and uh, dropping a line with a hook and some bait and thinking, uh, you know, I'm going to catch a fish. But this devotion said when these guys fish, they use nets and they caught a bunch at a time. And he kind of went so far as to say that the knots in your net are your relationships. I go, wow, that's pretty good. So here as a church, we have some relationships. We're getting to know each other, we're praying for one another, and we're, we're doing projects together. So um, who wants to start uh, on this verse and for a couple of I'll go ahead and start. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Matthew 4, 19, uh, the King James says, and he says unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But this is when Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and saw two individuals, Simon and Peter, or Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother. And like Chuck said, they were casting their nets. They were going about their day, going about their lives. 
And, you know, Jesus calls anybody, calls anybody who is willing to follow. And in this verse, I, I would like to point out the key verse, or the key word is make you. And, you know, Jesus has a, has a way of transforming your life and transforming your thoughts, your heart. And all we got to do is follow him. And in, these, in this particular passage here, it uh, goes further down and it talks about James, the two brothers, and they were helping their father mending the net and Jesus called them up also. And the Bible says they immediately followed. So it's not like, give me a few years, Lord, give me a few days, give me a few months, I'll come back and I'll put my life in your hands. No, Jesus wants it today. And, you know, he did a good job in uh, looking at these apostles and engaging them in their every lives. Because some made it and some did not. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Jared? Yeah. And so our, our whole mission out there was to go and just try to reach as many. There's a lot of people there. There's a lot of lost people there. Um, and as there is everywhere, you know, some places it's kind of obvious you can see when you come to the Navajo Nation because of everything that's gone on, whole nother subject. But it, it's very obvious that there's a lot of lost people there and that they're, they're grasping and looking for something. And so we want to be right in the center, as I was talking about, on that intersection of trying to get out there and cast our net out. And, and trying to get a message out to, to plant seeds, which we're going to talk about here in a middle, little bit, and to water. And, and that there's somebody maybe here that, that is just right there on the edge that is, uh, uh, there's, you know, there's high rates of suicide. There's, there's high rates of illegal activity and crime. And it, it's, it's a lot of just survival, you know. And so we're just out there just trying to cast our net out there and, and to just do what got what God has told us to do, right? And, and just like it, it says uh, right before that in, in Matthew uh, 4, it says 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, then he goes in and he, and he tells him. Jesus is preaching? Yeah, that's what it says. That's, a, that's what it says. So Jesus is preaching. Yeah. So if you want to be like Jesus, then you ought to be preaching. A absolutely. Bit, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and that, that's the whole thing. It's, it's, and it's not even that we're like talking. We're just, we're just casting a net. We're just throwing it out there and bringing it back. And especially on, on Saturday night when I was there, it was really, it was just casting a net out there. And, and hey, we, we caught it. And I don't even want to say caught a few. It's not even that. We're just trying to give hope out there. You got to uh, pray with a lot of people. They came in. A lot of people, you know, homeless that are walking through. People struggling with addictions and, and uh, that they, they were walking through. And just trying to connect with them and say, hey, there's another way. We've been there. We know how it is. And so it's, it, it, it really is. It, it's going back to it's my favorite verse is, is Matthew 6. 33 and it's like follow me you know and uh, seek the kingdom of heaven and then everything else will be added to you right and then he, and then right after that 34 he, he says and i'm just paraphrasing this he says uh that you don't don't worry about today uh, don't worry about tomorrow because today has its own problems and so on that day we were out there and the problem was is that there's lost people and so we're going to go out there yeah we, everyone had things to do chuck was out there for like four days straight, <laughs> like sleeping in a van, like down by the river. No, nah, he was close to the river, though. Yeah, I noticed but, that on the yeah. way out. The right there. And so that's where he was at. And so, you know, uh, props to him on that and just doing, so doing the work. It's the reservation, out. right? And we're trying to reach the Navajo Nation outreach. I mean, this church is right border the river. So we're really, you know, technically in the United States. But we cross the river right around the corner here and we're on the res. How do you say the name of the chapter next to us? Nananaza. Nananaza. I got to work on that one. <laughs> so it's our neighbor chapter. I should know that one before any other. But yeah, there's 110 chapters on the reservation. The ship rock was a chapter, and that's where we were. And um, yeah, so, and again, to your point, he's making us. We got to practice. So when you go fishing, the first time you're fishing, you're probably eating knots and you're you know, just fumbling all over the place. And uh, it's, it's a learning curve. The process. Doing. Yeah, for sure. So, and again, he ends his uh, ministry after three and a half years of going town to town, preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I always like to say to that verse, how far is your hand? 
It's right here. It's like in front of you. The kingdom of heaven is like right in front of you. Everybody's always heaven minded. The kingdom of God, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. So the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of heaven is heaven. We're all hoping to get there when we die. But it's not about when we die, when we get there. It's like here and now, right? And we're going to elaborate a little bit on that last thought before we jump into the next one. No. Okay, good. So Mark 16, at the end of three and a half years, he said to them, go into all the world. So we have our Navajo nation, a nation within a nation. We have the whole United States and we have all these other countries all around the world. And Betty always sometimes says that people think about going to Africa or go to India. And we are called sometimes yes. to go like halfway around the world to China. But, you know, next door to your next door neighbor, I once yeah. heard a preacher say, if you can't go next door and tell your, your neighbor neighbor about Jesus, you're not ready to cross the pond. <laughs> so he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel. So it's going to take words to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. And that's the focus. The unbeliever is condemned. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So one of the 62 boxes that TCT sent us were a couple boxes of anointing oil. And we have them back here. We have two different kinds. We had uh, spike nard and then one with myrrh. And man, people that we were encouraging people after different teachings, grab some oil, pray for one another, we'll anoint them in the name of the Lord, right? As James was teaching, James 5, 13 through 18, we kept doing that. And, you know, an elder in a church is kind of like, you know, it's like a board of directors, but I would even say you've been in church three to five years and, you know, you got your driver's license, you're an elder in a church. <laughs> if you have faith to pray for someone, it's not like you have to be a pastor or be ordained to use oil and pray for someone. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick. So I don't know if you guys want to piggyback on any of that. I think it's your turn. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, with the anointing oil, we don't want it. It's not snake oil. We're right. not. There's no power in the oil. There's nothing special. We we've got a package that somebody sent us hundred dollar oil. You know, had anointing. I was like, I, I, I couldn't recommend. I don't know. Maybe the the properties that weren't anointing, but it's, it, it's 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 kind of a thing where people kind of go off like, oh, anointing oil. It's it's you know, we might as well be Catholics. We're like, oh, holy water. Right. You know, there's there's not a there's there's it's not about that. It, it's it's about the the prayer of faith and coming with the oil that hey, we we blessed it. Okay. But it doesn't mean anything unless you pray, you know, the name of Jesus with with your prayer, and you're coming and you're bringing that. And even elders, if somebody could be an elder, you in the church, and there's only two people, it's, hey, all right, I'm gonna bust out the oil, like James says. So yeah, uh, uh, but that's kind of it. Was amazing that there was so much. There was a lot of free books and free CDs and free music, all Christian based that was brought from the children's home that you've kind of just had, right? That everyone sends to you. And so everyone was able to go there and, uh, and, and get, a, uh, get some different things that maybe they take home and watch. They take home and read a lot of books. And so we were able to just uh, maybe those, those type of materials will be a blessing to them in the future or somebody yeah. in their household, right? Yeah, that's so, good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know, looking at the verse here, it says, "Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature." And out in Chip Rock, we ran into a lot of different people. And on Sunday, we had a service, and we were able to hear a message. And also, visitors came. And to add to the bookstore on wheels, uh, there was a lot of content. Uh, I got a couple of DVDs, and you know, it's information to help us grow as Christians. And also to help other individuals from different parts of the world. And I found a lot of family uh, content in those books. And uh, me and my wife are reading those. So again, it's we want to be available to the community, and especially to uh, unfortunate uh, members of Shiprock who, you know, unfortunately walk around. And that's who we mostly engage with. Um, someone was hitchhiking from Chinle, or no, I'm sorry, the Gucci guy, and he stopped by. We gave him water and a little snack pack, and he enjoyed that. And he a little bit, of, he heard a little bit of the Christian music, and you know, um, I'm glad we made an impression because he said thank you. And that's really what we're there for, and what we want to be for the public, and in general for the world, as you know, followers of Jesus. Mm, that's good. In this area of scripture, too, um, I would also say Jared does a good job looking at 
um, translations and certain um, parts of scripture, this section of Mark was not in the earliest, earliest copies of the transcript. So it's hard to build doctrine. It was added maybe about 100 years later. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, maybe even a little bit longer. So not to say it's, it's, it's in the book now, but so this verse I'm going to bring to you is 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. So a lot of people will just look at that one verse and say, you got to be baptized to be saved. So whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, and then you'll work your way to go get baptized as soon as you can find some water. Yeah, and absolutely. do it publicly. So the baptism doesn't save you because that's a work. The Bible clearly says you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works. Baptism, anything that you could do, whether it's 15 of these prayers, jumping jacks, you know, it's a work. Anything you're doing is considered a work. Baptism is a work. It is a sign or a declaration of being saved. It's a public proclamation. There's a lot of reason for it. But the focus on this is those who do not believe will be condemned. So if out there in Shiprock, when we, you know, people came up and said, hey, do you believe in the Lord Jesus? Um, you know, and they call upon the Lord for salvation. I believe they're saved and they get hit by a bus on the way home and they never made it to this baptismal tank. I don't think Jesus is up in the throne and saying, wow, I really wish I'd let you, let, love to get you into heaven, but you know, you didn't, you didn't get baptized quick enough. You know, you didn't look both ways after you asked me to save you. Um, so we talk a lot about good doctrine and if you're going to go preach the gospel, that's the number one reason why people don't. They don't think they have all the answers or they might get a question that they can't answer. The fear of public speaking is number one. The fear of dying is number two. So people would rather die than, than public speaking. So you start sharing the gospel and try to share the scriptures and someone asks you a question you don't know. I can see, but you just kind of trust in the Holy Spirit that God's going to help you lead that conversation. So um, did you know what people were going to ask you? What the kind of conversations you were going to have when we were out there? No, I, I didn't. I, well, you kind of get an idea because I talk to a lot of people that are, that are lost and hurting. So it's just... It, I, yeah, yeah, so I, I had a pretty good idea. And, and uh, that's why I kind of... Uh, I've been diving a lot. And you've all been hearing it about, you know, obedience. And that's where this verse comes in, right? It's he who believes and is baptized, right? If you believe, you will be baptized. Right? Why? Because we are being obedient to God. If he calls us to be baptized, why would we not be baptized? Because we believe in him. He also calls us to, what, be fishers of men, to do the works that, and that he has commanded us to do. And if, if we believe in him, then we will do those things, yeah. right? If we really believe in him. If not, then we need a question. If we don't have a want to be doing things for God, then we should probably question what our belief is in. Right. Is it in a belief of Jesus or is it in a belief of, I'm just doing this because I believe I'm going to heaven? Yeah. So, yeah. And so when I had these conversations with people, I just bring that up because a lot of people, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, my parents are Christian. <laughs> to me, it doesn't mean anything. And I'm like, well, what about you? What are you doing? What, what's going on? And so uh, I was just able to talk, uh, really, you know, help a lot of people. Pray with a lot of people. And, uh, you know, from the beginning, there was a guy that was real drunk there on Sunday. Yeah. By the end, he was helping us out. He's sobering up. And, and uh, then we were able to talk to him a little bit more, uh, uh, give him some food, give him uh, a lot of stuff, and, and really trying to get people into some sort of program like yeah. Joy Junction if they're willing to. So, yeah, yeah it, it was really good. You helped a kid out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, we had definitely some testimonies. What do you think on some of this? Yeah. No, I think it was great because, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions. You know, if I follow Jesus, my life will be perfect. Or, you know, if God's the God of this world and this universe, why are there bad things? And that's, you know, the, the normal uh, questions we get is, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my daughter died or my mom died, you know, and God doesn't love me. How come he's making me go through this? You know, and that's the typical stance. But a lot of it comes through obedience. Like Pastor Jared said, if you're following Jesus, you're not going to be out doing things you're not supposed to. You're not even going to be thinking about that. So a lot of the answers to people's questions come directly from obedience and how can we please God and what can I do to change my life to please God. And, you know, that's the general misconception that we have um, in our area is, you know, God should give me everything. I should be happy. I should have this and that. I know God, you know, like prosperity gospel. Right. And that's something that, you know, we want to, 
come in and say, you know, all the apostles that followed Jesus, uh, they lived great lives, but they lived it for him. And to the world, they weren't great lives. Yeah. But to them, you know, they did everything for Christ. Yeah, that's good. And again, um, there's some churches that just love the idea of miracles. And I love to see miracles, too. Um, I can't, without talking at 17 again, and these signs will follow those who live in my name. They will, that's the name of Yeshua. They'll cast out demons. So um, there's some churches that think every sin issue is a demon that's, you know, that needs to be cast out. And, um, and again... You know, there's some churches that think they can bind them up. And 2,000 years later, if that was true, they'd all be bound up in a timeout. And they wouldn't be causing havoc. So Jesus didn't bind up any demons. He would cast them out. You know, he'd tell them, be gone. And uh, we're casting them out. We have that authority to tell them, scram. You know, you're, but we, if we're tying them up, who's loosening them again? Because, you know, they're, they're doing what they're doing. And they may not have authority to be where we're at. We're definitely dwell with people. But... I always say, if you're dealing with somebody who is demon-possessed, uh, we would know. We had one guy who was asking for deliverance. I mean, he, like, in the middle of the sermon, he's like, I need to be delivered. I'm like, I think you are. You're here. And I, there was nothing about his countenance that made me think that he was demon-possessed. He was taking in the word. He wanted more. If he was demon-possessed, the demon would have probably wanted to couldn't, well, couldn't hang out there. Check, was, check this out. So, yeah, and, yeah. and Chuck didn't see this, but right when that guy was doing that, yeah. there was a, a guy in the back who just got ticked off and you didn't even see it like was was like cussing at Chuck in the back and was like trying to fight him right when this is happening yeah. and uh, and you know and it wasn't until like right now I'm like whoa that could have been a spiritual thing you know because this yeah. guy's asking for deliverance and this other guy just started getting mad and and started uh, cussing at Chuck and and cussing dirty and you did I don't know how you didn't know I just so, stayed, I was yeah, staying focused yeah. on the message and, and dealing with the you know this the spiritual and, teaching That's and so he was yeah he and he was trying and he was like I'll fight you right now and and so then I just walked up say hey you all right you need some water and he's like no I'm good and he sits back down and so <laughs> just showed uh, and him I'm some love right? yeah. that settled him down yeah and he just settled down but yeah I didn't even think about that until just now about uh, that that whole situation because I just thought it was some. Uh, you know, like, oh, it's a single thing. You know, we deal with that. And sharing on top of it, when you're doing spiritual things, sharing good news, the enemy will try to distract, will try to throw a, a wrench in the, in the party. And, uh, you know, it's so don't expect, you know, there's going to be some some opposition. If you're going to be a doer of this word, if you're going to try to go fishing, you're going to try to share the gospel, there's going to be some distractions. But you just got to know, I, I follow this verse, and I'll give it back to you. First John 5.18 and 5.19. First uh, John 5, 4 says, Whoever is born of God overcomes. This is the victory that we have over the world is our faith. Verse 5, Who is an overcomer? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 18 and 19 says, Whoever is born of God overcomes, and the wicked keeps himself, which I think is obedience. If you're keeping yourself in obedience, Absolutely. the wicked one can't touch you. Absolutely. And then verse 19, The whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. So if they're not born again and they don't, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, they're subject to demon possession, demon oppression. They're pawns of the devil. And that's the world we live in. So either you're born again and, and if you're in obedience, if you step out of obedience, if I started committing adultery and you guys didn't know about it, I think Satan could pounce all over me tomorrow. If I'm in adultery, I'm willfully yeah. in sin, yeah. I'm out of the will of God, then yeah. God's like, my hands off. You know, pounce on them a little bit. And, you know, even there's a, a teaching in 1 Corinthians 5 where he says, Turn them over to Satan, that his flesh may be destroyed, but his soul may be saved. That was the guy sleeping with his father's wife. Your turn, I think. Yeah, and, you know, just speaking on that a lot more, uh, the Bible talks about, you know, God coming in and cleaning your heart. And it's just like cleaning your house. But, you know, after you're done cleaning up, you go outside and get dirty, come back in, and it's filthy again. Same thing when you get saved, you got God's grace, and you fall into sin again. You know, it's not only that God cleanses one demon out, but now you got a whole host of other demons in your heart and in your house. So again, it's more important to be in obedience than it is to, you know, fall into temptation, which I see as the easy route. 
and just doing what we want to do every day. Yeah, and I think the book John, 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you cannot be demon-possessed. They can fly around like flies on a, on a bologna sandwich just bugging you, landing in your hair, and you're constantly swooping them away. I don't think you can be possessed if you have the Holy Spirit in you. Um, but you're right. This, it's, they don't go away. They don't leave you alone. There's going to be some opposition. They're going to try to distract you. They're going to you know, try to mess with your household. But again, this is what we're trying to preach the good news for because there's safety in Christ. Not only are you being saved for heaven, there's God's protective provision over your life and in your life. You want to, you want to look up something? Oh, no, no. I, I was for the next one. Good. All right. So we're going to go to the next one. So Jesus gives, we're going to talk about fishing. We're sowing seed. We're planting the word. So Jesus, by Luke 8, before I show you this verse, um, Luke is in a chronological order. By chapter 6, they've already said he's not the Messiah. They've already, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, rejected his claim to be Messiah. By, by chapter 8, he's now teaching privately to his disciples. And publicly, he's speaking parables for the rest of his ministry. So, because they rejected his claim to Messiah. But here's where he teaches the parable of the sower. So, um, so I'm not doing all the talking. Can you read that? Yeah, and when a great multitude had gathered and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and the one uh, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air uh, devoured it. Remember, birds in the in the all throughout the Bible is always evil. Like anytime you see birds, it's always something bad. Uh, devoured it. Some fell on rock. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop of a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's good. So the next verse is going to explain why he's talking to parables. And then the, the next section is going to be him telling his disciples teaching further on it. So at first first glance, what's your thought on this parable? You know, first glance is we have a work cut out for us, especially in this area uh, where we have a lot of rocks and a lot of weeds. You know, there's a lot of uh, different parts of our culture that can hinder growth in Christianity and especially our walk with Jesus. And, you know, we that was part of the deliverance request you know, these people are putting witchcraft on me and, you know, I need help. Uh, so again, it's how do we put our trust into Jesus to where we're putting the seed on good ground and it grows in our heart. And if a tree grows, it produces fruit. So what kind of fruit are you producing? Everyone has some kind of fruit they're producing in their life. Mm -hmm. And is it good fruit? Is it bad fruit? You know, only we can tell. And we'll be judged by it by Jesus one day. And, you know, this parable... You know, speaks a lot when I was first learning about the gospel and learning about God's word that, you know, God spoke about the resistance to the gospel and being rebellious and, you know, not taking in the good, the good seeds, not wanting to grow because we can hinder our own growth. We can have a good soil, but put little rocks in there or put a few thorns next to that, that seed and it'll just pull the moisture from it and we don't grow, we're just stagnant. We sit there and we just stay in that one spot through our lives. You know, it takes some good preaching, like Brother Jerry the past couple of weeks, you know, to get it out and break up those rocks and let that tree break through and grow. And if you look at how a plant grows, it breaks through the seed and it finds its way up to the sunlight, to the light. And, you know, we can compare that to the things of this world where we've got to break out of that ground That's good. and see Jesus. Yeah. First thing, I like how he ends here. He who has an ear, let him hear. And unless you're talking to a deaf person, you need to learn sign or you can write it down for him or something, right? But, um, so, I know when you first go into ministry and you, you want to start being a fisherman, you want to start sharing the gospel, you think everybody's going to get saved, your family, your friends are going to say, That's awesome, dude. Go get him for Jesus. But right here, even if, just about breaking it down, we'll do that next. 
but there's four different types of people you could possibly be witnessing to. You may or may not know what kind of heart they have while you're sowing, but this sower is faithful to sow. He went out and started sowing seeds. So are you the sower? And for the rest of the sermon, we're going to talk about you being the sower and how God provides good seed to us. So it just helps put things into perspective that even if we gave all four categories, 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, there's nothing in this passage that even indicates it's an equal quarter, 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 which makes a whole, right? But there are four different kinds of folks that you might be trying to sow seed into, and all you can do is speak it, and you're like, man, I hope you really heard what I'm trying to share with you, but uh, you got to sometimes drop the mic there and leave it sit, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, here is, is yeah, we're the sowers in, of our of our, our crops and everything, and, and now, you know, with this parable, right, it, it's God's the sower, right, and, and he's going out, and I would even say, not 25, 25%, I would say that there's a very small percentage <laughs> that yields good crop, even inside of a church, you know, even inside of a church, you know, a lot of people believe and like I was, I was talking with Scott a little bit, but it's hard to get even the ones that say that they believe to even come to church sometimes. It's hard to even get that. So it's like, okay, well, where's your fruit? Well, what, what are you doing here? I, at least, so my family are, are farmers. Both sides of my family were farmers. That's what they did. And, and so I have my garden that, that I grow and, and I didn't fertilize it very good this year. I got an okay, but not as, it, it was an okay yield, but it wasn't as good as it, it, it should have been. But the, just the weeds, I took care of all the weeds, but those weeds will take over very fast if you don't take care of it. Yeah. And especially if it's getting water, the, the, lead, the weeds will grow and you got to pull the weeds out by the, by the root. And so a lot of us, we got a lot of weeds in our heart, in our soil of ourselves. And we need to start just, instead of cutting them off, we need to start pulling it out by the root. We need to find that root cause of the problem, the sin in our lives, and say, okay, where do we, where, how do we get this? And we pray, God, how, how do you get, how do you remove this from me? Help me remove this. You know, it, it's hard work, but it's trying to get to that root. And we always just try to, oh, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to start being better. It's like, Lord, hey, show me what my problem is yeah. and get to the root. And so, yeah. And, and it's ultimately like, what's the whole thing for? To yield a crop of a hundredfold. Mm -hmm. To yield fruit. To bear fruit. That's, that's the, whole, the whole thing. I'm glad you brought that up because that's the beautiful thing about Jesus when he gives parables. There's a few different ways that this parable teaches. I'm thinking as a sower, like I'm the guy who's trying to sow seed into somebody else's life. And you're like, wait a minute, this is God trying to sow seed into my life. So I've got to ask myself, is my heart, you know, turned into one of those other three uh, types of soil, yeah. right? Because ultimately it's between me and God first. He wants my garden to, to look good. So then I can go outside. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. same with the parable, prodigal, the parables of the prodigal son. You know, you could be the parent who has a prodigal son and when you're reading that, or you could be the prodigal who took off and started partying your brains out and had to come back to God. Or you could be the goody two shoe in the family that never really did anything wrong. You got the brother who's a jerk and he's you know he's getting the party and you're mad because you know, you never got a party. So you can be like all three <laughs> characters in that parable. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's yeah. cool. So let's go on again to the reason why he explains the purpose of the parable. We added that little subtitle there. Then deceit. You want to read that section there? Yeah. Eight, yeah. Nine and ten. Uh, then his disciples asked him, saying, what does this parable mean? And he said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is given in parables that... Seeing, they may not see, and hearing, they may not understand. And, you know, this is true, in a sense, in my life. Before I committed myself to, to you know, being used by God. You know, I got saved when I was 12, but committing yourself to be used by God is a totally different commitment and a totally different stage in my life. Um, from my perspective and you know this is where it speaks to me that when I hear that I understood it but if I were to say it to just anybody else you know it's difficult for them to understand in comparing a seed to the gospel and what does that really mean what are you trying to say to me and I find that relevant in a lot of different verses in the Bible um, and a lot of misinterpretation out there mm -hmm. but I do like how you know Jesus makes it simple and then we make it difficult on our side. What about this? What about this? What about that? 
but if this happens, you know, we always have that. And I like, I like this verse here because, you know, it tells us that it's, it's basically a comparison, as easy and simple as, he, as it can be, so that way you can understand it. And I like that. That's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, it's kind of going into the next thing, but uh, it's very important that seeing that they may not see and hearing that they may not hear. And it's kind of like the, the verse where Jesus talks about casting uh, that which is clean before the unclean, meaning casting pearls before swine, you know, verse. And so you, we do come up against that, and, and that is where we become discerning. But a lot of times with the net, we just throw the net out and we bring the net back. And then whatever may happen with that net. And there's a lot of times where we were like, okay, well, maybe they're not ready yet. Not that we don't try, not that we don't cast the net out, but a lot of people just ain't there yet. You know, some people really have to hit rock bottom. Yeah. I had hit rock bottom. I heard the message all the way from when I was a kid. And it wasn't until I hit rock bottom, like, oh, all right, now I'm starting to get it because I don't want to be down here no more. You know, Chuck, too. Yeah. My wife's name is Annette. She's got five sisters. So they would go to a church, every Baptist church here, we're very bad, Southern Baptist. But that was an inside joke. Let's cast Annette into the sea, you know, the other five. <laughs> But yeah, so every time I say Annette, I'm thinking Annette, you know, a real Annette, and then Annette's my wife. That's funny. But so, yeah, so again, he's talking at this point about Pharisees and people who are unbelievers. They're still going to hear truth. They're not going to see it. They're not going to understand hard, it. Hard. But I love the first part of it. To you, if you're a believer, to you, it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Is that inside information? You're his child. Psst, he's going to whisper in your ear what might be a mystery to the world. They don't understand it. they got to wait till the last chapter for the mystery to unfold, right? Uh, but that's what I love about Jesus. Like, because you're a believer, I'm going to show you, I'm going to reveal some mysteries to you. You're going to you're gonna be the smartest person in the room, spiritually speaking, especially, yeah. you know. You have wisdom and discernment that comes from God. That's a great promise. So for anybody who's on the fence, man, just, just start calling out to God. He'll reveal himself to you in ways, and he'll start revealing things to you. And I just love that idea that he's making known mysteries of the kingdom. Uh, but to the rest of the people, the unbelievers, um, there's... It's, it's in parables. So, um, any final thoughts before we get into the next section? Yeah. All right. Section. So now um, he's going to take his disciples privately and uh, explain it. You it. Yeah. And so, right now that the parable, the parable is this. So right. He told them, "Hey, I'm going to tell you the mysteries that hasn't been given over to them, and and it's like they have a hard heart." And, you know, that's probably the problem, right? Is It's not even that it, it's so mysterious, right? Because it is made simple, like Chris said. But it's that a hard heart wants to twist it. And our perverted mind, it because it means, perverted means twisted. Twisted thinking, twisted thoughts. And so it wants to twist it. And, and like I, I brought up on Saturday, we, Chuck and I were out Friday. We're looking for elk. And, uh, and so we were out in the mountains and we were talking about is that we'll, we'll give a message. We'll, we'll speak on it. We'll speak just plain truth here. And there's people that will sit, sit in church or listen here and be like, I don't agree with that. And it's like, okay, well, it's just the word of God here. This ain't even my opinion. It's pretty simple here. I don't agree with that. And, and so that's, that's where it kind of goes. The mystery is going to give it to you. But then some people just, they're not going to want it. They're, not going to, they're just going to reject it. So now the parable is this. The seed is, is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and he takes away the word out of their hearts. Uh, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while. And in this time, temptation fall away. I think that's the majority of the church. I, I just, I'm going to say it. I just, I, I've been there. I think that's the majority of the church right there. They believe, oh yeah, yeah. how many, how many people come in? Oh, we're going to do all this stuff. We're going to do, and then, you know, maybe a few months, maybe even a year, maybe two years, and they just kind of fall off. And the next thing you know, hey, they're in jail. Oh, they got in trouble. Oh, they're back to their old ways. Or they're just not, not, not even doing anything. That, that, I think that's the majority of the church. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked uh, 
choke with the cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. And so those are the people that probably just stay in the church, right? They worry but, about their lifestyle. They, you know, what? I gotta start tithing? I gotta give? What? Let me see you at the casino. <laughs> I, I see them at the casino. They're still, uh, you know, faithfully going to the casino, you know, but, uh, and, and it just, there's no fruit comes from it, right? Because it ke- keeps getting choked out. You've had those plants. I had a watermelon, two watermelon plants that I, I should have took better care of. I didn't. I watered them very well. I just, I, I messed up on their, they're fertilizing, but they just, it's like they would start giving fruit. And they'd be like, oh, here we go, here we go. And then it would be like, no, I'm just kidding. And then they wouldn't come to church. And so, yeah, that was my watermelons. And that's a lot of the people inside church also. But the ones that fell on good ground are the ones having heard the word with a noble and good heart. Keep it and bear fruit with patience. And so those are the people that, that stick with it. You don't have to be at this church. You don't, it just, it, I want you to just bear fruit wherever you go. That, that's all that matters. And so that they're here, you know, we see it, we know they're bearing fruit. They want to do the work of God and, and that they're just not letting the enemy come in and snatch it away, right? Or their own cares of the world. That's good. Chris? Yeah. And... You know, a lot of this has to do with the great deception with the devil. And a lot of this comes into how do you play into others' growth. Anybody you bring to church, anybody you invite to church, you know, we should encourage them more and help them grow in God's Word. And that's fertilizing. That's simpler than just giving them verses all the time and correcting them all the time, you know. And this is where, you know, it kind of explains that, where the devil takes it away. Or temptation in their life, you know, makes the gospel not so, not so great anymore. The word of God is not so powerful anymore. And, you know, when you think you're saved, you're doing great, you're more concerned about, you know, how do I look? How do I appear to everybody? Versus, you know, growing more in God's word and helping people. And, you know, that's why these parables are so uh, great because they're in detail and they they apply to nowadays. You know, a lot of this was said back um, in time, but we fast forward to 2024. You know, we can easily compare this uh, to different aspects or different uh, individuals that we meet with and that you run into every day. You know, we all know someone in our family who uh, fall into one of these three categories and I'm hoping the people here are the ones that the God's word fell on the good ground. And, you know, we're keeping that fruit and that tree alive and building it every day. That's good. So uh, I'm a little older than these guys. So my three daughters, my youngest is 22, then there's 26, and then there's 33. And then I have a son, Aaron, who's 23. Um, and two of them... Um, by adoption, or if you will, as 11 years old and older, uh, two from birth. But I'm just to bring attention to the first one. So I know this is for us first, but this devil, <laughs> when you share truth with somebody, I'm telling, I can almost set a clock by it. I would share with my children, because again, we're supposed to minister to our family, and God's been really um, speaking to me about that. I mean, there's a lot to do, and sometimes I can be out of balance and want to save the world and neglect my family, because I've got so much zeal. So God's like reminding me, you're Family's your first ministry. But it reminds me of my kids. I would share, you know, we do, it's not easy being a pastor's kid, by the way. You're just preaching at them all the time, and you're sharing, you're trying to teach them because you want them to be prepared. But man, not only within a day or two, they'd come back from school, and they would tell me about somebody who told them exactly the opposite of the biblical principle or verse that I was trying to teach him. That's exactly what happened. You see, the see, it's the Word of God. Those by the wayside, they'll hear it. Not to say my kids are, you know, we're trying to plan. But it, this is even for believers. The devil will come and try to take away the word of truth that's in your heart. Lest you should believe it and be saved. So there's certain things that we're trying to teach our kids. Somebody's going to be coming right behind you. One of those, First John oh, yeah. 5, 19. Yep, the whole yep. world is under the sway of the wicked one. He's going to use people to come and or try television. to. Or television. Or television. And undo what you just tried to plan. So again, I, I want to stay focused on whoever's listening to us, challenging you to be a sower. We're going to be fishers of men. We're going to end by talking about where are we going fishing next. Um, if you are a bunch of fishermen, 
Like, when's the next time we're gonna go fishing, guys? Where's the next place? Are we gonna charter a boat? What kind of fish are we gonna try to catch? You know, we need to start praying about that. But um, this is just, I think it just, again, that's what I love about Jesus explaining the prayer. We're going on a fishing trip, is that what you're saying? Yeah, man, we're going fishing. <laughs> What kind of fishing trip? <laughs> and fish, fish, or men fish? Filet of fish. That's the, uh, the yeah, exactly. And while you're fishing, you know, you never know. The guy who's driving the boat needs to get saved. Or, yeah. Everywhere you go, whatever you do, and it's always good to build a relationship and go fishing with some buddies too, and or even your family or camping and all that kind of stuff. But um, let's kind of we can talk about that forever. So here's a verse as Jared and I was driving around Friday. I kind of had this idea. Let's do a panel discussion. Let's invite the church to share a little bit too. So I want to get into that. Um, be thinking about something you want to share about Ship Rock or even this message. And I, I, I love when it gets conversational. We all share instead of us just talking at you all the time. But this is Second Corinthians nine verses ten through fifteen. This first verse is what jumped out at me. Now may he, capital H, talking about God, may he who supplies seed to the sower, that would be us, and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. That's the most important thing, that you become more righteous and do the right thing. Verse 11, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes Thanksgiving through us to God. Lots to be thankful for. Verse 12. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints. I bolded that. Supplies the needs of the saints. That's the church. That's believers. But also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. Again, lots to be thankful for. 13. While, though, while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God... For the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ. We're confessing and we believe. That's part of our testimony. I believe in Jesus. Do you? We're, keep going. And for your liberal sharing with them and all men. Not just other believers in church. All men is all men everywhere. Verse 14. And by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. That's God's power. Verse 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Whose turn? Oh, go ahead, Chris. You know, that's another that's another great reason why, or another great reason to follow Jesus. Because, you know, it simply says that he'll provide your needs. And that's essentially the whole concept. You devour yourself to God. You follow Him. You take up your cross. You die to yourself daily. And in turn, God will take care of you. It may not be the most extravagant life you've ever lived, but, you know, God will definitely take care of you. God will provide your needs and provide, you know, essentially, a, for me, He provides me rest. And that's the most important thing in my life right now. And, you know, that's a hot commodity amongst other people is how do I find rest in my life? You know, I got my family, my kids, my extended family, and then I got my job and we got our neighbors, you know, all that on any other person, you know, creates a lot of stress. But for Christians, you know, we look to God for our needs. And verse 10 says, he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And, you know, as you grow, as you speak with people, you know how to deliver the gospel. You understand uh, what people um, hear and how you can clarify that. And I also find that enlightening with God because um, at some point, I didn't understand some of these verses, but after you study it or after you hear from someone else who's preaching, you, know, you have a better understanding, and then you can also help that with others. Um, but I do like that. Yeah, and uh, very important is, is God provides our, our needs, you know, needs. what we need, and not, and not our want. wants. Yeah. <laughs> but if our wants are in the will of God, then those would be provided. Yeah. You know, yeah. we see. So like, like exactly with this, right? And it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's just, I'm going to read this in Proverbs 3 because like I say, there's nothing that I can say that God's word doesn't say better. 
And so it says, My son, do not forget my teachings, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and men. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make, straight, uh, make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For him, for whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects a son in whom he delights. So, I mean, it's the same, same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as I was thinking about this, he mentioned we were going to do our gathering at our, our church the second, uh, first Saturday of every other month. And all of a sudden I realized the Navajo Fair and uh, any, you know, this is the big deal. So we threw it out there. All of a sudden God provided a location. I called up Pastor Derek. He has a 30 by 40 tent. So he shows up with five or six people. We're putting up the tent. Um, I sent out a couple emails to our ministry partners. And they're like 62 boxes of books and tracts, Bibles, all kinds of seed to give out uh, was sent to us. And then, you know, the anointing oil. And then again, because the anointing oil is there, like, you know what? Let's keep talking about James 5. We all need prayer. My prayers aren't any more special than your prayers if we both really have an earnest belief. And, and later on in James 5, he says, For the effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we're made righteous because of the blood of Jesus. God imputed his righteousness on us. He clothed us in Christ so we have his righteousness. So all of our prayers are... But how do you effectively and fervently pray for someone if you don't know what's going on in their world? So you got to communicate with people. Hey, tell me what's going on in the world. What, what can I be praying for you for? That's just a great question to start any conversation before we even start evangelizing and sharing, trying to explain the Trinity. I mean, there's so many things we can go after, but hey, man, what's going on in the world? How can I be praying for you? Uh, thanks for asking, man. My aunt's sick. And I just start, I asked waiters, waitresses, hey, how can we be praying for you? We're going to play over our meals, anything we can pray for. And then there'll, some people are like, oh, I'm good. Well, I'll just pray for God to bless your socks off. So let's just pray. God, thank you for this food. I pray you bless uh, Sarah's socks off. And just love her, Lord. Just thank you for her serving us here today in Jesus' name. You start praying for people. I don't need permission. I don't ask them, hey, can I pray for you? I don't need permission to pray for anybody. I'm letting you know. I'm going to be praying for you. You might as well give me some information that I can pray. <laughs> more on target, you know what I mean? But uh, again, it's, it really is about providing the needs, and there's another verse, and I'll end with this. Paul says, you know, one man plants, another waters, and God gives the increase. I know we'd all love to have that conversation and lead them in a sinner's prayer or try to get them to change their mind about something and immediately go vertical and cry out to God, oh God, please forgive me, I want, I want you in my life, and then we try to Encourage them to go vertical and even give them some lines to jumpstart that prayer because uh, they just may not even know how to do it. But, you know, we talk about that a lot. Is it really sincere? That's between them and God. But at the end of the day, we'd all love to harvest. We'd all love to see an unbeliever, boom, light bulb come on and be saved like right while you're talking to them. I mean, I, I love that. I mean, that's a, that's a story. But we're really just called to plant and water, plant and and water, and maybe weeks later, something you said might finally germinate and break through and start catching the sun. Yeah. But you planted that seed, and it takes a little time. And because you do some planting, you and honey, it takes time. There's a process. You got to plant, you got to water, and then you got to wait. And he gives us that parable too, as a farmer who's patient, who's got to wait for the harvest and the whole process. There's, and me and my daughters, we planted some orange one morning. We were doing breakfast, and we had all these little orange seeds, and we're like, hey. What if we planted these seeds out back? And I'm like, that's a good idea. But when, when, all the, the first question is, when are we going to have oranges? So I Google it. Uh, <laughs> how quick does it take to have oranges? They say three to five years. Yeah, five years. Three to five, you know, so, I mean, we're going to plant this today. You're going to be out of the elementary school and middle school by the time we have oranges in the backyard. So don't be expecting it tomorrow, which is another word for us as we are patient with people. You know, we're giving biblical truth. Don't start expecting fruit tomorrow night. I mean, God is very patient with me. Any final thoughts on that?
before we uh, open it to the crowd? I, oh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. one thing to add, uh, like what Chuck said, God gives the increase. <clears throat> you know, there's times in ministry where you feel like you do everything, you're doing this, you're doing that, but nothing's coming about it. And <clears throat> that's frustrating that I'm putting all this time and effort into God's Word, I'm reading His Word every day, you know, I'm doing this and doing that for God, but I'm not seeing anything. You know, I like that God put that verse in there that He gives the increase. So maybe it's time to slow down and, you know, get closer to God and say, you know, why, why am I not producing enough fruit? And, you know, I find this a lot with um, patience with my little girl. I have patience with all my other kids, but my littlest girl, Elizabeth, um, she's a little naughty. And she likes to do things when I say, don't do that. She goes really slow and does it. <laughs> so, again, only God can give me that increase. Only God can give me the patience with my little girl. And only God can give me grace in my life. And that's what I wanted to add. I really like how you said that. That's good. Jared? Yeah, I, I just want to I want to hear from uh, everybody. That, that, I know we're running a little long here, so I don't want to hold this up too much. But uh, yeah, I want to hear from. Uh, does anybody have anything to share uh, about their experience down at Shiprock? I know not everyone can make it. Um, if, if anyone wants to share, I don't know. Most of the people that were here are, for some reason, not here today. So, uh, but I'll give I'll give one for mine. It's, it's, it, but hey, don't wait for me to get done talking. If you want to share something, you're down there. Share it. Is that I was preaching on Saturday night, and when I'm, I'm preaching, I just kept looking over to that speedway that used to be there. You know, there's two speedways. One, you know, one used to be not a speedway, but it was a sicko or something. And then, and there's a speedway now. They're now a speedway, so they closed one of them. It used to be the thrift way on the corner. And so I was preaching, and when I was preaching, I just kept looking over there to that to that that empty lot and those vendors in there. And I was like, man, there's somebody over there that needs to hear this. So I was just speaking real loud. You know, just reading Psalms, just preaching, uh, and just trying to talk with people that are walking by. And and so at the end of the night, uh, and everybody's pretty much gone in the tent. And and one person he come he drives up and he just comes and he sits down. He's like, hey, how you doing? He's like, I was sitting over there, and I just been hearing you all all week, and I've been wanting to come over here, and I was getting ready to leave. The traffic's crazy, just backed up. And he's like, I couldn't get down to the road back to Gala. He's like, but I, for some reason, kept seeing holes to come over to your tent. And he was like, and he's like, I felt God was like telling me, go there. So he came over and he sat down and he just started breaking down and telling me a little bit of his story. And so I got to pray with him. And he's like, man, this is, this is, you know, I, I feel that God is trying to relight something in my life. You know, and he uh, recently quit his job that he found to be immoral that God told him to. But he was just kind of, everything was kind of falling apart for him. Not that he was even really drinking or he quit drinking. It was just, everything was kind of falling apart. And, uh, and so uh, I got to talk with him and, and, and pray with him. And he got to tell me some pretty amazing stories. And, uh, and then uh, Pastor Derek was there and got to pray with him. And I was like... All of this and the people I got to pray with, I said, this right here is like, if this is the only person I got to talk to and, and be to pre and, and to just share the word of God with, it would all of that, none of it would even else matter except for that guy because it was just maybe, maybe we were just there for the one guy. Chuck probably had a few of those people too. And so um, that was just my experience is that, you know, it's tough going out there. Chuck stayed out there the whole time. It's tough trying to fit it into your schedule and go out there, but then God, He always makes it worth it. You yeah. know, He always does it. Um, Marlon and Lucinda, do you want to talk about what it was like to have church without walls? Scott was out there for a few minutes but had to go. Anybody else? Marvin? We did church without walls. Jay? Uh, Eddie? Anyone? Want to share about uh, just what it was like to do the church and people walking around? And That's kind of what we call it, church without walls, because, uh, you know, people driving by still can't. But they were able to over listen to what happens, and I'm sure... And I'll count on it. So I've heard this a lot. Since COVID, a lot of Christians quit going. Uh, I don't remember George Big Horse. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've seen him. Uh, I've seen he him. called. He finally called. I've been texting him a copy of our message every week. And again, he's been going through dialysis. And his doctor, you know, because of his low immune system, kind of still gave me encouragement not to 
hang out. I said, well, don't go to church. I said, well, doctors you're gonna, say, I told don't him, go to church. You're going to get healed here and not get sick, but he said, you know, be just between you and God. Let him direct your steps. I encouraged him. I said, the devil will talk you out of hanging out with the church all day So long. will doctors, obviously. Right, exactly. So, I mean, again, it, we invite and the Holy Spirit leads. And um, I just always want to end with this last verse before we go into anything else. This is how 1 Corinthians 15, 58 ends. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Some translations like say it's not useless in the Lord. It's, you know, you're not going to hit a you're not going to hit a home run every time. Babe Ruth had the most strikeouts, but he also had the most home runs because he swung at everything. <laughs> so when the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart to, to say something, just go with it. You can't cookie cutter this stuff. The Holy Spirit knows who you're talking to. It's going to give you a word of knowledge, a word of. It's going to help lead that conversation. You can't cookie cutter this stuff. It's good to have a couple of opening lines that you might use, like, "What's God's favorite vegetable? Lettuce. Let us pray." <laughs> oh, by the way, do you pray? And I use that everywhere I go. This is an icebreaker. I don't know what to say. Or some people say, "Hey, do you know what happens when you die? What do you think happens when you die?" Well, it's funny you have to think about that all the time. Well, what, what do you think happens? And they don't tell you what they think happens, and then you can tell them what's going to happen. Because <laughs> everybody's going to die. 10 out of 10 people die. So, um, would that be anybody else want to come up and share? Yes, no? Okay. All right. What's the next verse we got here? So, yeah. that's it. So, if you do call this your church, um, some believe in tithes, some call it offerings. Um, whatever you give to God is between you and God. But if you love our ministry and you want to sow seeds into this ministry so we can do more things, you can either text the word GIVE to 877-557-7717 or you can go to pushbay.com forward slash G forward slash Fruit and Christian or you can actually come back to church and put it in the offering plate here. Uh, Lorinda, our treasurer, takes care of all that and honey and and uh, we don't have anybody who gets paid here except some independent contractors who may work for five or six or ten hours on a project. We give them a little something to cover their time. And uh, But um, everything that's provided to this church is for ministry. And, of course, uh, we do record these broadcasts, so we can rebroadcast them on Overcomers TV, Roku, 50 million people at Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play, uh, iOS App Store. 600 million people have an iPhone or an iPad. That's 8% of the population of this world has access to download this channel. That's just crazy. That's because everybody, the other 94% aren't in the Apple <laughs> cold. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Facebook pages for our live broadcast, and also the audio and all your favorite podcasts. It's Facebook. Platforms. Facebook does that too? Yeah. Cool. Wednesday night, we do food and fellowship. Talk about some topical studies. It's more conversational. So um, we try to get here by 5.45. We eat till 6.30, 6.30 to 7.30. And then we have our discipleship meeting from 7.30 to 8 for our parsonage and our discipleship house. And then also, we don't have a slide on here, but that, that we have 10 o'clock, we have the Navajo uh, Bible study. And that's uh, it's taught. So it's reading the Bible in Navajo and learning Navajo. So you don't have to be a Navajo speaker. Most of the people that go to class aren't even Navajo speakers. That's a half of them. And so, um, uh, and Betty, she, she teaches that and, uh, and uh, Nancy and every, all the other Navajo speakers are in there that are teaching the non-Navajo speakers and uh, learning that. And so it's a pretty cool way. So check that out. Cool. Chris, open us. You want to close this? Up? Yeah. Uh, Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. We just thank you for your grace and your mercy and of everything that you have given us, Lord. You know our needs and our wants. You know everything that, that we need. You know what we want, but help us, help it be in your will and your will alone, Lord, that we be able to, to look towards you, be a blessing to you, and that we can uh, just sow the seeds in the garden you have given us, in the area that you have given us, that we be able to bless all the people uh, with your word, and then we'll just, you will bring the increase, and we'll just have faith that you're going to bring the, bring the increase, and all the weeds, and all the, the feet that are trampling these seeds, I just pray, Lord, that, uh, that that would be ended in the name of Jesus, Lord, and these new believers, and that be strengthened in your word and your truth. We just thank you for this, and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.